When I first got the job, I couldn't believe my luck. I was a very solitary person. I loved to read and be alone. When I saw an ad for a park ranger manning a fire tower, I just about jumped out of my skin. Working overnight at a Walmart wasn't exactly the best job in the world. There are some stories I could tell about that as well. But I applied for the job and was ecstatic that I got it. They made me do a week of training before my first shift. Most of it was dry reading and making sure I was qualified in CPR. They showed me the job's ins and outs, and then I followed in my car as we drove to the tower. In the middle of the day, it was awe-inspiring to stare up at the underside of the tower looming above me, suspended high in the air by the metal pylons. Once I started climbing the narrow metal stairs, with hints of rust at the edges, I was somewhat less than excited. In fact, I was terrified. I don't like heights very much. It's not like I go all vertigo or anything. It's just, I prefer to stay on the ground. Once we reached the top and pushed open the trap door to get onto the deck that surrounded the tower, I was doing a little better. I opened the door that led into the tower's interior. Looking around the room made me forget all about the terrible climb. It was like a small apartment. There was a small refrigerator, sink, counter, cupboards, and a small table. In the center of the room was a table with a map permanently attached to it. Of course, there were windows all around. There was a 360-degree view as you would expect for a fire tower in the middle of a state park. The view was absolutely amazing. I could see the peaks and valleys for miles in every direction. It was a photographer's dream. The other ranger explained what was expected of me. We worked 24-hour shifts, so there would be times I would have to sleep, but I had to set an alarm and get up to scan for problems at least once per hour during the night. During daytime hours, I had to scan every 30 minutes. There was a radio to report any trouble, and a phone, in case I needed to call the fire department. In my mind, I was already drooling at the thought of getting paid to take amazing pictures and sit around reading books. The ranger told me that it was extremely important that I read the rule book first thing. He asked if I had any questions, and I said no. He reinforced that I could not leave the tower no matter what until I was relieved. I followed him down the narrow staircase to get my supplies from my car. He got in his truck and hesitated for a moment as if he wanted to say something else, but then he shut the door, wished me well, and drove away. It took me three trips to get all my stuff up to the top. At home, it's nothing to bring a few boxes of groceries into the house. Here, it became life and death. I was near the top with the box in front of me when I stumbled on one of the narrow steps and nearly fell over the side. I paused for a long moment to regain my balance before continuing to the top. It suddenly struck me that this job might not be the cakewalk I thought it was. I pushed that thought to the back of my mind and went for my next two loads. Basic supplies, books, phone chargers, camera, occupied the second and last trips. Once I was up for good, I collapsed into the chair. I was on my way to Napland when I heard static on the radio. I jumped up and grabbed it. Hello? I said, but no one answered. I figured this was the ranger's subtle way of reminding me it was time to do a check, but lugging three loads up the tiny stairs of death had put a serious crimp in my fire watch time. In fact, it had been nearly an hour since the other ranger had left. I did my slow pan around the room, checking each part of the forest for smoke and seeing none. Having successfully completed my first go-around, I celebrated with a bottle of water while I put the groceries away. The cupboards weren't empty, but they weren't a gourmet's delight either. Nearly a full shelf of baked beans didn't exactly thrill me, but I had the supplies that should do me for a few shifts. 
I sat the bread on the counter and loaded the cold cuts in the fridge. I would get some more options the next time I went shopping. By the time I finished putting things away, it was time for another check. The sun was starting to set, so I grabbed my camera and took some amazing pictures. I couldn't wait to upload them to my computer at home. As I looked around the room, my eyes landed on the manual. I realized I hadn't read it yet. I sighed and took it over to the chair. I was sure it would have me out cold in no time. As I opened the book, a piece of notebook paper fell out. I picked it up and read. The real rules. 1. Never, under any circumstances, leave the fire tower until you are relieved. 2. Turn off all lights between the hours of 2 and 3 a.m. 3. If you receive a radio transmission or phone call between those hours, do not answer. 4. If anyone knocks on the trap door during those hours, tell them they'll have to wait until morning. Do not open the door. 5. If you see a glowing object floating toward the tower, don't look at it. Cover your eyes and count to 50. When you open your eyes, it should be gone. If not, cover and count to 50 again. 6. If animals surround the tower, don't go down to look. Fire your flare gun into the air twice one minute apart, then lock yourself in the bathroom and hope for the best. I sat the note down and stared at it. Was this a joke? Were they having some fun with the new guy? I wasn't looking forward to getting hazed at two o'clock in the morning. I put the note back in the book and skimmed through the manual. It was a real snooze fest of standard rules and nonsense. For the next check, I decided to use binoculars. I was rewarded by seeing a bear and three deer. I pulled out my camera and took some pics, but the zoom wasn't quite as much as I needed to get some really good shots. You could still tell it was a bear, but it was a little blurry. I decided to go camera shopping with my first paycheck. What's the use of having this spectacular view if I can't take good pictures of it? Soon after sunset came the twilight. The sky lit up a brilliant orange. I took some more pictures and did my scan. I was just about to go back inside when I noticed a thin wisp of smoke in the distance. I grabbed my binoculars and tried to get a better view, but there were too many trees in the way. I pulled out my compass and got a general direction, then grabbed the radio and called the ranger on duty. I told him I had a fire and gave him the direction and general distance. He acknowledged and said he would check it out. I stayed glued to my binoculars waiting to see the smoke lessen. Minutes seemed to each take an eternity as the smoke continued to rise. Nearly a half hour later, the radio came to life. Hey, rookie, the ranger said. Did you find it? Did you put it out? I still see smoke. Did I tell you the wrong place? I said into the radio all in one breath. Whoa there, he said. Everything's fine. It was just a campfire. A what? A campfire, he said. Nothing to worry about. A campfire, I repeated in a daze. Yeah, you'll want to see more smoke and it should be a lot thicker and darker before you call it in. I stood in silence, my face beat red with embarrassment. Cheer up, the ranger said into the silence. At least you didn't call the fire department. I looked over at the phone knowing I was mere minutes from doing that very thing. Yeah, thanks, I said. Sorry about that. Don't worry, kid, he said. At least you erred on the side of caution instead of letting the forest burn down. I put my face in my palm and shook my head. So much for a good first impression. Twilight had faded, leaving a few last vestiges of light as the clouds transformed from dirty gray to black. I began to realize just how alone I was out here when the canopy of the night fully fell. Doing my checks from inside was nearly impossible. I had lights on, and every window I looked out of became a mirror of me looking back in at myself. 
alone in a wooden box suspended a hundred feet above the ground, made it that much creepier. I stepped out onto the deck in the cool evening air. The total darkness was oppressive. I couldn't see anything. How was I supposed to see smoke? I did a slow walk around the deck looking out blindly at the trees. As my eyes adjusted, I was able to make out some shapes of the mountains and even the soft glow in the distance of the nearest town. That was small comfort to know that things still existed out in the world and I hadn't been plunged into this cover of darkness. I finished my check and stepped back inside. After being out in the darkness, it was way too bright. I turned off the main overhead light and the light over the entrance. The room settled into a comfortable glow with enough light to see but not blind. In fact, it was a little too cozy. I felt a nap coming on. I laid down on the surprisingly comfortable cot and closed my eyes. I woke sometime later to static sounding on the radio. I reached for the radio to answer it, but something in the back of my mind told me not to. I looked at my watch and it said, 2.12 a.m. I froze. Looking around the lit room, I thought about the strange rules I had read earlier. I reached up and turned off the light, plunging the room into darkness. As my eyes adjusted and I could see a few things, I looked out the window and could swear I saw someone peering in at me. Just then, I heard static on the radio. There was a voice trying to get through, but it seemed too weak. I waited to see if they would call again. A minute later, static sounded again. Beneath it, I heard the voice. It was a little stronger this time. I could just make it out. I froze. I hadn't turned the lights on yet, leaving the room in eerie darkness that left me feeling very exposed. I slowly panned around looking out the windows and remembering the earlier feeling of being watched. You can look all you want, but you won't see me, the voice said. It's after three, I said, hoping the terror I felt wasn't evident in my voice. You have no power over me, the voice chuckled. It wasn't a pleasant sound. Normally you would be correct. However, you broke the rules. What if I didn't know about the rules? I said, grasping at straws. Nice try, but you knew that you should be safe after three. Damn it, I thought. It picked up on that. So what do you want? I said, fearing the answer. We are hungry, the voice said. Only now it sounded like many voices speaking at once. Come down and let us feed. My legs turned to rubber as I stumbled over to the door and stepped out onto the deck. The moon was rising half full, casting light into the darkness. I looked down and saw over a dozen large animals surrounding the tower in a circle, and each one of them was looking up at me. I dove back inside and locked the door. I frantically searched for the flashlight. Once I found it, I picked up the phone to call the ranger's station. There was no dial tone. I hung up and tried again, but still nothing. I pulled out my cell phone, but there was no signal. I paused to clear my head. Okay, I thought. You're freaked out right now, but what's actually happened? A weirdo on the radio, some animals around the tower. This list is making you paranoid. Just then, I looked outside, and there was light off in the distance that looked like an airplane. The problem was, it was heading straight toward me. It was mesmerizing. I found myself staring into the rapidly approaching glow until I realized it was going to ram into the tower. I found the best cover I could on the opposite side of the room and surrounded myself with as much furniture as possible. Being that the furnishings were sparse, that meant I dragged the chair over in front of me. I covered my eyes and hoped for the best. I may or may not have mumbled one of those, 
I promise I'll be good if you get me out of this prayers. The seconds tumbled into minutes. Nothing happened. I peeked over the edge of the counter, and the light was gone. I breathed a sigh of relief and wondered why I hadn't heard any engine sound. I decided it was because I was too busy ducking for cover. Then it hit me. I grabbed the manual and pulled out the list of rules. There it was, rule number five. If you see a glowing object floating toward the tower, don't look at it. Cover your eyes and count to 50. When you open your eyes, it should be gone. If not, cover and count to 50 again. I read over the rules again and realized how many had come to pass. For a long moment, I thought that maybe it was an elaborate joke, some of the rangers yanking the rookie's chain. But there was too much I couldn't explain. The radio transmissions, the glowing light, the animals surrounding the tower. Then I realized I had broken that rule too. I hadn't fired the flare gun as instructed. I dug through the cupboard where the emergency supplies were kept and found the gun. I grabbed two flares and stepped out onto the deck. As I questioned the intelligence of firing flares that could end up causing a forest fire when I was supposed to be trying to prevent them, I heard a strange sound. I held my breath and cocked my ear for a better listen. It wasn't just one sound, it was many. I glanced over the side of the rail toward the ground and saw the animals all growling and pawing at the ground, working themselves in a frenzy. I backed away and loaded the first flare, then pointed up and fired. It rose majestically, glowing blood red until gravity slowed its ascent and pulled it back to earth. I watched closely to make sure not only that it went out, but where it landed, just in case. I waited a minute and fired the second flare, watching where it landed as well. I stepped back inside and hid in the bathroom as instructed. I knew in my heart that I was safe from the animals as long as I didn't go down the steps. The radio sounded off, scaring me nearly half to death. Fire tower number five, the voice said. Have seen your flares. I'm on my way. Are you physically injured? No, not at the moment, I said. I'll explain when you get here. Roger that, en route. I tried to calm my nerves by thinking about what job I would apply for next and how unfortunate it was that this one didn't work out. I thought about what I was going to tell the ranger when he got here. I couldn't tell him the truth, but what else could I say? There were some animals at the bottom of the tower that scared me. I honestly considered calling him back and telling him not to come when I felt heavy footsteps on the bottom stairs of the fire tower. I must have been daydreaming and let time slip by. I stepped out of the bathroom and went to the trap door. Are you here already? I said into the radio as I reached down to unlatch the trap door. That was fast. What are you talking about? Came the clear answer over the radio. I'm not there yet. I paused as I felt the footsteps come closer to the top. Where are you? I said quietly. I can barely see the tower. I'm probably a mile away. His words hit me like a sledgehammer. I looked down at the bolt I was about to unlatch and pulled my hand back very slowly. Which direction are you coming from? I said. Southeast. I looked in that direction and sure enough, I could see headlights approaching. The radio sounded again, but with a slightly different voice. Tower, ignore that last transmission, it said. I'm already here. Let me in, please. I stared down at the trap door as though it wanted to bite me. Tower, let me in, it said more insistently. I backed away as something began beating on the trap door with tremendous force. The boards shook with every impact. I stepped inside and locked the door, then barricaded it with my only loose piece of furniture, the chair. Tower 5, 
Tower 5. I don't know who that is talking to you, but it isn't me. Do not open that door. Repeat. Do not open that door. I backed into the bathroom with the flare gun in hand and locked the door. The pounding on the trap door became louder. I knew it wouldn't take much more of a beating. The whole room shook with every impact. I closed my eyes and prayed in earnest this time. And then my salvation came in the form of the engine sound of a pickup truck. I knew the real ranger was here. I listened as it came closer and then stopped. There was an awful silence for a moment and then gunfire. Over and over, multiple shots in rapid succession. Then there was a lull followed by more shots. The pounding on the trap door had stopped as soon as the truck pulled up. The coast is clear, Ranger. You can open the door now, came a voice over the radio. I put my hand on the knob, smiling to go out and greet my savior in when I heard a weak transmission. Don't! Not me! It rasped. A heartbeat later, the screaming began. It was a gut-wrenching scream of terrible suffering. I could hear it beneath me. All I could do was drop to the floor and curl up in a ball as the screaming went on and on. I closed my eyes and tried not to imagine that poor ranger being ripped to shreds by God knows what. Soon, the screams lessened in volume and intensity as though they were moving away. I rocked back and forth, hugging my knees until unconsciousness mercifully took me. I woke to strange voices calling my name. I opened my eyes, and I was surrounded by people in blue uniforms. I panicked and backed away from them as fast as I could until my back hit a wall. Calm down, one of them said. It's all right. I looked around the room like an animal that had been backed into a corner. I was ready to fight my way out. Are you injured? He said. My mind raced to remember where I was. I looked out the window, and it was morning. The sun was shining, and I could see blue clouds. Everything from last night came back to me in a rush. I looked around the room and saw nothing out of the ordinary. I'm not injured, I said to the EMT. Can you tell us what happened here? A ranger said from behind them. I looked over at the manual that contained the list of rules and for a heartbeat considered telling him to read them. No, was all I said instead. Can I go home now? The ranger glared at me, wanting answers and not getting them is frustrating, I know. Is he alright to drive? The ranger asked the EMT. They gave me the once-over, BP, lungs, heart rate, and didn't find anything to be concerned about. I'd say physically he's fine, the EMT said. The ranger sighed. Go ahead, he said, but I'll want to talk to you tomorrow. I nodded and stood, gathered my things, and started toward the door. When I got to the open trap door, I hesitated seeing it had been hacked open with an axe. I took a tentative first step, then another. Surviving a night as I had only to fall down several flights of stairs would be quite ironic. As I made my way down, white-knuckling the railing the whole way down, I saw people busy at the bottom. They were picking up shell casings with gloves and putting them into plastic bags. I could see spots of blood here and there, but no bodies, either human or animal. I saw the trail of blood as it disappeared into the woods. I stood on the bottom step for a long time, wondering if I was allowed to step onto the ground. I took the step and bolted for my car. I started it up and drove out of there as fast as I could. Just as I turned onto the gravel road, a deer walked out in front of me. I slammed on the brakes and slid to a stop mere inches from hitting it. It didn't move, just stood there staring at me. As I looked more closely, I could see blood on its nose and mouth. My heart skipped a beat when I saw a shred of a ranger's patch impaled on one of its antlers. Its eyes bored into mine as I slammed into reverse, then drive, swerved around the deer, 
and broke every speed limit getting home. I called my boss and quit as soon as I got there. Then I packed and started looking for a job in the city. Maybe I can find a nice quiet warehouse to guard. But if it has a set of strange rules, I'm walking out. No questions asked. <laughs>